Hello everyone, in this video I'll talk about some problems that are related to interrupts but are also relevant on their own. These problems aren't exactly beginner level or easy to explain, but since I've made videos about interrupts and recommended that you use interrupts, I feel obligated to talk about these issues since you'll inevitably come across them. The topics I'm about to discuss are not easy or beginner friendly at all by nature, so if you get lost along the way, know that that's probably not on you. I'll try to not sidetrack too much and explain them in the simplest terms that I can, but if you get lost anyways, you can come back to this video later, after you've gained some more general knowledge. Also, most of this video will be based on information from the XC8 compiler user guide. If you're interested, you can also check it out yourself. Anything you can do and or configure about the compiler will be documented here. It is not exactly beginner friendly, but if you have some background knowledge, it's actually pretty well documented. But that's enough of an introduction. So. Let's get started. Well, let's start with the main title of this video, Reentrancy. But before I explain what it is, let me show you how easy it is to create a problem related to it. I have an empty project here. Let's define a random function. I'll just make a function that adds two numbers and returns the result. What the function does is not actually relevant. It's simple, right? This is a very basic function that can be used in a lot of places. But watch what happens when I try to call it in the main function and in the interrupt routine at the same time. Let's try to build this project. We get an advisory or a warning. It's telling us that this function is not reentrant and that the compiler duplicated it. Now, this program will run without a problem, but at a cost. I'll get into that in a bit. You'll probably have the question, what is reentrancy? Reentrancy is a term used to describe a function. So a better way to ask this question would be, what is a reentrant function? A reentrant function is a function that is safe to execute a multiple of at the same time. What that means is that a function is reentrant if you can call it again while in the middle of executing that function itself. You'll probably ask, how is that even possible? For a single core microcontroller like this one, there are two ways that this can happen. One is if you call the function inside of itself, which is referred to as recursive calling. I'll talk about that more in the next part of this video. Two is if you call the function from an interrupt routine, like what I did here. Remember how interrupts work. Your microcontroller will call the interrupt routine when an interrupt occurs, which works just like a function call. This means that nothing is stopping the interrupt from occurring while in the middle of executing this function. So this add function can be called via the interrupt routine, while the main code is also in the middle of executing that function. You may ask, what is wrong with that? Why is that a problem? The problem is the way in which the variables are stored in the microcontroller. By default, your microcontroller stores its variables in fixed locations in its RAM. I won't get into why, but this approach allows codes to be small and efficient, which is perfect for a low power and low resource device like a microcontroller. Now, don't take what I'm about to tell you at face value. This isn't necessarily how it's done, but imagine that your microcontroller has two registers called add1 and add2. These two registers are connected with some circuitry so that another register called add result will contain the addition result of these two registers. Your microcontroller also has RAM, where it stores the variables it's working on throughout its program. Microcontrollers perform addition operations by putting the values in the RAM onto these registers, then writing the resulting register back onto the RAM in the return location. When this function is called, these two arguments get stored in a fixed location inside of your RAM, decided by the compiler after building your project. Then, the microcontroller puts these values into add1 and add2 registers to perform this addition operation. But even though we're writing this code in one line in C language, it isn't exactly representative of how the microcontroller actually does this operation. Microcontrollers can only work on one thing at a time. And again, don't take any of these examples at face value. I won't go into too much detail, but typically, the microcontroller will put the first value into add1 in one instruction. Then, it'll put the second value into add2 in another instruction. The add result register will immediately contain the addition result through some circuitry. So now, the microcontroller will put this result back into the RAM in another instruction, and the addition is complete. The problem is that this function is generated in a way that it directly works on these memory locations. It's generated in a way that it'll always put these RAM locations into add1 and add2, and it'll always put the resulting value into this RAM location. Now, why is this a problem? 
The problem is that this whole operation isn't just done in one go, or in one instruction. I mean, almost no operation is done in one instruction, which means this operation can get interrupted. Say you called this function in your main code, and the microcontroller put the first value into add1, but then an interrupt occurred. Remember, the microcontroller saves the values it's currently working on when an interrupt occurs, so it'll save the add1 to another location. Now the microcontroller will jump to the interrupt vector, and there's another call for the same function, but with different values. Now, since the function is generated in a way that it uses fixed RAM locations, the new values will overwrite the values from the ongoing function call. The microcontroller will do its addition and leave the interrupt routine. But when the microcontroller goes back to where it left off, after restoring its add1 value, it'll try to put the second value into the add2 register. But as you can see, the second value is not the same as the original one, meaning it got corrupted, and the resulting value will be wrong. So you see, re-entering this function while it's in progress caused the function to fail, which is why this function is non-re-entrant. By contrast, a re-entrant function would be one that can be called while another call of it is in progress without a problem. Try to keep these terms in mind. Let's go back to the error given by MPLAB. It says that the function is duplicated by the compiler. This is the way the compiler fixes this issue. It duplicates this function and makes it so that the main code calls one and the interrupt routine calls the other. So that each function will have their own fixed locations that can't be altered by the other function call. This is why I said that this program will work without a problem, but the cost is that you're using double the memory that is normally needed by this function. Like I mentioned before, the interrupts aren't the only reason to need reentrant functions. Let's talk more about recursion. Recursion is a method of solving a problem through solving smaller instances of that problem. When transferred to coding, recursion refers to a method of calling a function within itself to solve a problem. For example, one of the most common examples would be finding factorials. We can use this function to find the factorial of any number. As you can see, this function is calling itself. And of course, if you try to call this function in your program and build, you'll be greeted with an error complaining about recursion. The problem again is that this function is not re-entrant, so you can't execute another instance of it while in the middle of executing one. Now, if you have no idea what the hell this is, feel free to YouTube or Google the term. You'll be greeted with more resources than you can imagine. But if it looks complicated, don't worry. Recursion is the end level of coding that gives headaches even to people that use it all the time, which is why it's a must-have question for job interviews. I'll put a link down below for a video you can watch to understand the principle. The video is long, but just watching the first example will be enough for you to get the idea. By the way, functions like these, meaning functions that use recursion, are referred to as recursive functions. But in reality, all recursive functions can be written without the recursion. As an example, we can also implement this same function like this. It's just that some problems are recursive by nature, and it's intuitive to solve them with recursive functions like in the factorial example. By the way, this kind of counterpart solution to a recursive function is referred to as iterative function, or a looping function, since it'll loop as many times as needed to find the solution. You may be wondering why I'm telling you all this. It's to prepare you for the future where you can learn further than what's taught to you in these tutorials. I try to teach the foundations of everything so that even when you're done with these videos, you can add more knowledge onto them by yourself. I'm also telling you all of this because you can in fact make functions re-entrant in MPLAB or more appropriately in the XC8 compiler. This recursive function approach is something commonly used in computer programs and your microcontroller is also a small computer. The reason why you can use recursion in your computer but not in your microcontroller is the difference in methods used to store variables. By default, your microcontroller stores variables in set locations, which leads to fast execution of codes, but it is also the reason why recursion is not possible, like I explained before. By contrast, for computers, your program has a reserved pool of memory that it can access whenever it needs to store variables. And whenever a function is called, all the related variables for that function will be allocated a part of that memory. But the difference is that, whenever you call another function, the variables needed for this new function will be stored above the previous call, in a newly allocated location, 
which means that each function call will have their own sets of local variables, even if the function happens to be the same. And this is also true for each subsequent function call, given that the program still has enough memory to allocate. This is why recursive functions are possible on computers. This type of memory allocation or variable storing is called storage using software stack. Try to keep this term and concept in mind. Also, whenever a function reaches its end or returns, its corresponding allocated memory location will be emptied and can be used by other functions. This is done in a manner of LIFO or last in first out, but we're starting to sidetrack here. I don't really want to get into how this software stack is implemented or how it works since that is not relevant for this video, but if you're curious, you can Google these terms on your own. And of course, given that a microcontroller is just a small computer, it is also possible to use this software stack method with them to make the functions re-entrant. It's just a matter of implementation. Unfortunately, not every PIC microcontroller has support for software stack. X8 compiler only supports software stack implementation on enhanced mid-range and PIC18 microcontrollers. To be able to use this software stack feature, you can open up your project properties using this button. I've talked about these in short in a previous video. Software stack is a compiler feature, given that compilers are what generate your machine code, meaning the compiler is the one that implements this software stack and not the MPLAB IDE or anything else. So navigate to XC8 global options here. Change this category to stack options. Here, you can change the stack type, which is gonna be compiled stack by default. This is the default data storage type that uses fixed memory locations like I talked about before, which yields smaller and more efficient code, hence it's the default. Try to keep this term in mind. You can change this option to reentrant stack, which is used interchangeably by the XC8 compiler with software stack, which the compiler can also refer to as reentrant model, so try to keep these terms in mind. If you select this option, the compiler will configure all functions to be reentrant. This means all of the functions that are defined in your project will use software stack as their data storage method. Now, this is bad. You pretty much never want to use this option. The reason is that managing this software stack comes with a lot of extra code. So the reentrant functions, which use software stack, are considerably slower, and they also take more memory to implement in general. You only want a function to use software stack if you absolutely have to. Otherwise, use the compiled stack, which uses fixed memory locations. And yes, you can use both at the same time, since the software stack will be implemented on the remaining part of the RAM that is not used by anything else, like the variables or functions that has fixed locations and etc. This brings us to the next option, hybrid stack. With this option, the compiler will detect the functions that need reentrancy and use the software stack method on them, and use the compiled stack for the rest, which is the best of both worlds. Below the stack type, you can change the size of the stack for each routine. Like I said before, the software stack option will only work given that there is still available memory to allocate for the function calls. So if you re-enter a function too many times and run out of memory, the code will fail anyways. It's up to you, the developer, to make sure you never go past this limit. Stack sizes will be auto by default, which will make the compiler figure out the sizes, the compiler will allocate any free memory not used by the rest of the program into the stack. Here, you can set or limit the memory allocated to be used as software stack in terms of bytes. And you can set this limit for both the main and the interrupt routine separately, since they use separate stacks. They use separate stacks because otherwise, the interrupts can interfere with the main code stack management, since they can trigger at any point. But I won't go into too much detail about it, it's another can of worms. Just know that each interrupt or main routine needs to have their own separate software stack. Don't forget that we have 3896 bytes of memory for this microcontroller in total, which you can see right here. So this is the maximum stack size you can put in these locations in total. But remember, the rest of the program will also need some memory for variables or non reentrant functions and such. And any memory allocated to the software stack can't be used for any other purpose meaning the allocated memory needs to be kept small enough so that the rest of your program can fit their static variables in there as well. Also, as stated by the XC8 compiler user guide, if you don't need a software stack for a given routine, you should manually set its size to zero here, so the compiler doesn't automatically allocate some space for it for no reason. 
I'll show you a quick example on the use of software stack using the recursive factorial function I have here. This video is definitely not for absolute beginners at this point, but I still want to keep it as close to that as possible, so I'll keep this example really short. Let me just set this stack type to hybrid and the sizes to auto. If I try to build now, MPLab tells me that it detected possible hardware stack overflows, which is due to recursion, and that, in response, it reserves some memory as software stack for each routine. Like I said, hybrid mode detects the reentrant functions and uses software stack method on them. Since this function is calling itself, the compiler detected that it's a reentrant function due to recursion, and it automatically allocated the unused available memory to be used as software stack in response. You can also see how much memory was reserved for the software stack in total right here, which again will be all of the free memory not used by variables or non reentrant functions and such, since we kept the sizes to auto. As an example, I'll try to find the factorials of the numbers from 1 to 10. I'll program my microcontroller in debugging mode so that we can see the results. Don't worry about the debugging, it'll be the topic of the next video, but it's not relevant for us here, so just ignore it. The program has executed up to this point, and now the microcontroller is halted. Now I can hover over these variables to see their results. If I check them one by one, you can see that the results are correct, so our recursive function is now re-entrant, and it's working just fine. But do keep in mind that, if you try to find a very big factorial number, you may re-enter this function too many times, and if you run out of stack memory, the whole program will start acting erratically, and it's up to you, the developer, to prevent that from happening. I'll also quickly show you another way to configure the compiler to use reentrant stack, which I don't recommend using, but it's up to you. Let me make the compiler use compiled stack again. There are specifiers you can use to force which stack type will be used for a given function. These are underscore underscore reentrant and underscore underscore non reentrant. These specifiers override the compiler settings for the given function and force it to use software stack or compiled stack respectively. If you're using compiled stack, which is the default, you can put underscore underscore reentrant before the function definition to force the compiler to use software stack for this specific function. If I build now, you can see that the compiler reserves some memory for the software stack, even though we're using compiled stack in the project configurations. But I think it's better to configure the project settings instead of using this method, since unless you're using this function on all routines including interrupts, you're recommended to limit the interrupt routine stack size to zero anyways, so you may as well pick the hybrid mode from there while also configuring that too. Also, there's no way to make interrupt functions or routines re-entrant. The compiler will always use compiled stack for interrupt routines, regardless of how you configure them. If I try to configure this interrupt routine as re-entrant and build, you'll see the output message saying that it was ignored. This is because you can't re-enter an interrupt routine or call them in software in the first place. They are not actual functions. They are just a code block placed in the interrupt vector. It's just that they act like functions by nature, since when an interrupt occurs, microcontroller jumps to the interrupt vector. But you can't pass a variable or have a variable returned from it or re-enter them since they are called through hardware. Now, to be able to use recursion, your only choice is to use a software stack. There's just no way around it. But what about the reentrancy problem caused by calling a function from both main and interrupt routines? What if you don't necessarily want to make your function reentrant? Or what if you know that an interrupt won't ever call a given function at the same time as the main code? Do you still have to use the complicated and slow software stack? Actually, no. Let me quickly write a simple function that increments the value passed to it and returns it. What the function does doesn't really matter. Let's call this function in the main code and in the interrupt routine at the same time to generate the reentrancy warning. As I showed you in the beginning of the video, we get a warning telling us that the function is not reentrant and the compiler duplicated it to solve the problem. You can just use this program like this. I mean, there's nothing wrong with letting the compiler duplicate your function if you have the extra memory for it. It'll work just fine. But if you also don't want that, there's another way to solve this problem without ever considering reentrancy. Now, I've talked about this in the external interrupts video. You can globally disable interrupts before calling a function and re enable them after the function call if you don't want the function to be interrupted. You can use this method every time you call this function in your main code to manually make sure that an interrupt routine never calls this function at the same time as your main code. This way, this function won't ever be called by two routines at the same time, 
But if I go ahead and try to build this, you'll see that we're still getting an error, and the compiler is still duplicating this function. Unfortunately, the compiler is not smart enough to automatically realize that you're manually preventing this reentrancy problem. You also have to manually tell the compiler to not duplicate this function. To do that, use this term before the function declaration. As you know, if you watch my info about C language video, this is a preprocessor term, which is used to inform the compiler ahead of time. This line will only apply for the first function declaration that comes after it, and it will prevent it from being duplicated if it's also called from the high priority interrupt routine. This is the syntax, and this number can be either 2 or 1. If you put 2 here, this function won't be duplicated from being called by high priority interrupt routine. If you put 1 here, the same will go for the low priority interrupt routine. If you want to prevent duplication from both interrupt routines, put the same pragma back to back with 2 and 1 on each, like this. But again, keep in mind, these lines only apply for the first function declaration that comes after them. I'll just keep the high priority one, since that's the only routine we're also calling this function from. If I build now, as you can see, we don't get the duplication warning anymore. But again, be careful, this doesn't solve the reentrancy problem. You're just telling the compiler to not duplicate this function if it's also called from the high priority interrupt routine. If you fail to manually prevent your program from re-entering this function, your code will still fail. So it's up to you to prevent that from happening by managing when the interrupts are enabled or disabled in software. Also, according to the XC8 compiler user guide, you have to disable interrupts before the function call. Disabling interrupts within the function call can still result in code failure, which, of course, also goes for enabling the interrupts as well. Now, let's talk about the volatile keyword. Volatile keyword is a qualifier used on variables, like this. Specifying a variable as volatile tells the compiler to limit the optimizations done to that variable. Now, if you don't know, optimizations are done by the compiler in an attempt to speed up and shrink your code. There are multiple levels of optimizations you can choose, some of which prioritize speed and some code space, but that's not a topic of this video. When enabled, optimizations may remove or change parts of your code to better accommodate the instruction set and hardware of your processor. Now, optimizations are compiler, microcontroller, and situation specific. Some code may get optimized on one microcontroller while it doesn't on another, even though the code itself is the same or just by changing or adding a simple step in your code, the optimization may change or even be removed. So, optimizations are, in a way, a black box for the developer, and the only way you can understand it is to inspect the assembly code generated by the compiler. Now, this is a problem, because there are instances where the optimization will break your code. Which is why you'll see in my videos that I have my optimizations disabled. I usually enable them after I make sure my code works without them, since an issue caused by optimizations will be really hard to debug. There are multiple ways optimizations may break your code. If you have multiple assignments like this, the compiler may change their order, or hold on to some of the values and update them later on, even though you tell the code to update them right here. Or, if you're constantly checking variables, the compiler may cache some of the intermediate values in a working register, like the add1 and add2 from the previous example, and use that cached value instead of reading the variable directly from the memory each time. Now, these optimizations aren't necessarily bad, and whether they will cause issues or not depends on your particular project, but there are situations in which they'll break your code, especially with the caching issue. You'll hear a common explanation for the volatile keyword, it tells the compiler that this variable can be changed from somewhere else, and to not make any assumptions. This explanation mostly refers to the caching issue. Imagine this code. I have a global variable named x, which is initialized as 0. When an interrupt occurs, it will be assigned the value 5, and in my main code, I'll make a while loop that will go on until this variable is equal to 5. Just imagine that I have some random code in here, and at the end of that code, I increment x. If x isn't defined as volatile, the compiler may go and say, instead of reading and writing this x from memory each time, and seeing if it's equal to 5, I'll just store x in a working register, and increment it on each loop, then use that register to check if it's 5. But we know that x can be updated by the interrupt routine, so what we actually want is that, whenever we check x here, we want it to be freshly read from the memory, since it could have been changed by the interrupt routine here at some point. This is especially important with hardware registers. When you read, say, port B, like this, you most certainly want to read the current state of port B, the register, 
not any cached previous values or something. In our code, we treat port b here as if it's a variable, right? This term could just be, I don't know, y variable or something. But we know that this is a hardware register, so it shouldn't have optimizations done to it as if it's a variable. So ideally, we should have this port b, or any other hardware register for that matter, defined as volatile, which we can't do because it's defined by the xc.h library in our project. But here's the thing. The reason why I'm not showing any examples here is because XC8 compiler automatically considers any variable that is a hardware register or that is accessed by interrupt routines as volatile, even if you don't specify it as such. So I can't show any examples of a non-volatile variable here, but even if the compiler automatically considers them volatile, you should still explicitly define these variables as volatile. You obviously can't do this for hardware registers, but for global variables that are changed by the interrupt routine, you should always add this volatile qualifier. Again, they're volatile by default, but by explicitly writing this qualifier, you're telling your future self or other coworkers that may read this code that this variable will be changed by other routines. This gives that variable more context and makes your code easier to understand in general. Now, you may ask, why not define all variables as volatile? Well, the optimizations are there for a reason. Volatile variables will always produce longer and slower code, and if you define all variables as volatile, you lose the context I just talked about. When someone reads your code, they won't be able to understand which variable is accessed by other routines, and your code will become a mess. The volatile qualifier has another purpose. If you define variables like this, they will be ignored by the compiler, since this variable is not used in anywhere else in your code which is also indicated by this white wavy underline here. The compiler will think that this line was a mistake and remove it, even when the optimizations are disabled. But you sometimes need these lines, especially when debugging, to see the value of a variable or something. But as you can guess, if you put the volatile qualifier here, this line won't be optimized away anymore, even if the white underline is still there. Before I end the video, there's another topic I'd like to mention. We've talked about reentrancy, which has to do with functions, but how about variables? What if an interrupt occurs in the middle of reading or writing a variable? This is a problem, and it will cause that data to be possibly corrupted. You may have the question, how is that even possible? How can reading or writing a variable be interrupted? To understand why this can be a problem, we first have to understand how interrupts affect instructions, and how the microcontroller reads from or writes to a variable. When an interrupt goes through to the interrupt controller, it will overwrite the next instructions with the ones needed to jump to the interrupt vector, while also saving values and current program locations and etc. I won't get into details, but understand that jumping to an interrupt routine is also done through instructions, as with everything else in a microcontroller. And an interrupt can't interrupt an instruction, it will instead take over the next instructions in line. So, if a read or a write operation is done in one instruction, there are no problems. That means they can't be interrupted. By the way, operations like this that take one instruction to execute are said to be atomic. Try to keep this term in mind. In coding, an atomic operation is one that can't be interrupted, which usually indicates that it's done in one instruction. But the problem is, many instructions, including simple reading or writing, are not atomic at all especially for an 8-bit microcontroller like the one we're using. As I've said many of times, microcontrollers work with registers, and for an 8-bit microcontroller like this one, the native register size will be 8 bits long. But an 8-bit register can only hold values between minus 128 to 127. This kind of short range of values won't be enough to make any meaningful calculation. But luckily, math operations can be divided into sections, which the microcontroller has algorithms to capitalize on. Variables that are longer than 8 bits can be stored by cascading multiple 8-bit memory locations. This is why the variable sizes in C are multiples of 8-bit, like 16, 32, or 64-bit variables, and the operations for these longer variables are handled step by step through algorithms. I won't get into how these are implemented, they are all taken care of by the compiler, but if you're curious, you can easily google them. What you need to take away from here is that, because the variable sizes can be bigger or smaller than the native register sizes, even small operations like reading or writing don't necessarily take one instruction to execute, which means they can be interrupted. Take this 16-bit variable for example, 
Say you're constantly updating this variable in the main code, and every now and then, an interrupt occurs and reads this value to make a calculation. Since the microcontroller can only update it 8 bit at a time, it takes two instructions to update this variable. Say that this variable was 701, which would be stored like this. And say that the main code is about to update it to 30,885, which is written in binary like this. Say the main code updated the first 8 bit like this, but before it can update the second half, an interrupt occurs. If the interrupt code reads this variable now, it'll read 30,909, which is not the correct value at all. Now, if we return from the interrupt, the second half will get updated just fine, so the variable itself won't get corrupted since the microcontroller will continue on from where it left off. But the interrupt routine still read the corrupted values, which depending on the application can be really bad. But what if the interrupt routine also writes to this variable? If the interrupt routine writes a new value to this variable and returns, the main code will still proceed to update the second half, which this time will completely corrupt the variable. This is especially bad if the next value of this variable depends on its current value, which will completely derail the code. Now, here's the worst part. Even if a variable is the same size as the native registers of that microcontroller, depending on the code generated by the compiler, an operation done to that variable can be non-atomic, like if you're trying to find a power or square root of that variable or something. So your only way to make sure is to check the assembly code, which can also change between compiler versions, between microcontrollers, or even throughout the development of a given code. So, the only way to make sure that your variable is always accessed atomically is to constantly inspect the assembly code, which would make for a very annoying workflow. Now, you already know how to stop a code from getting interrupted from the previous part of this video. To prevent this problem, we can just disable interrupts before performing any operation on this variable, like we did with the non reentrant functions. And again, you should do this with any and all operations performed on this variable, since you can never be sure about the generated code by the compiler. Also, understand that this disabling and enabling interrupts works because this variable is defined as volatile, so we can be sure that the reading and writing performed on this variable is done exactly how we tell it in code, without the optimizations changing or moving them. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe, it's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.